Well, we get to look into uh, what God has in mind for when it comes to attendance. You know, uh, the biggest question that we have to, you know, contend with right on the initial or right on the onset of questioning that is, um, you know, what is what is the church? What what does it mean to be a part of the church? And I just want to uh, remind us that church is not an organized place that we go and meet together. The Bible says that church is the body of believers, those who believe in Jesus Christ. And so I've often had people come and say, well, what does your church do here? What does your church do there? And my question is, I don't know. What are you doing? What are you doing? Because you are the church. You're the one that's the temple of God, and God comes to reveal himself to the world through you. And so in that way, yeah, there's places that we organize or that we come together, which we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more today, but church isn't this organized meeting. Church is what happens when you do life and go through all the circumstances that you go through. So today I'm going to be looking into a story, I'm going to look into a, two groups of people, uh, one right as God released the Holy Spirit, there was a community of believers and it begins to give us a glimpse of the very first group of believers or that early silence as Jesus was resurrected, this happened literally within a very short time, I mean it's the 40 days, it's the day of Pentecost, this began to happen, and something that has never happened in history before began to manifest there in a very different way. And I just want to leave that with recognizing that how people interact with each other, especially in an Eastern environment where it's a, um, it's a system of belief that's built on this class system, the class based system, and in that base system, how you, who you give honor to, how you handle things, the way you behave around other people is determined by what they deserve, by their rank or by their level in society. And there's actually books and things written about if you were to give honor to someone who didn't deserve that honor, it would in a sense dishonor yourself. It would in a sense make less. And this became very real to me when my wife and I went over to Israel as she was just sharing. And, then, and when we went there, we needed to leave early, one day early. And, you know, as per being in the United States, as per our perspective of the world, you know, we just went to the airport the day early and we went to the French airlines and identified that, you know, it would be really helpful. We have a flight out the next day, but what would be the possibilities of simply leaving 24 hours early? Same flight, just a day early. And we were met with an extremely surprising to me perspective. They wanted nothing to do with us because of the entitlement of Americans who have the audacity to think that they are so special that they could go and get their way without being some sort of dignitary, without being some sort of prince, without being some sort of high authority. What gives you the right to come and ask for something that benefits you? And I was really taken back by that, and it made me really examine the culture that we live in in America. And the foundational belief system that all men were created equal in the eyes of God. And in that, we have an uh, innate foundation. We have, a, uh, we have a worth that doesn't come from what we do, but we have a worth because we're made in the image of God. We're made based on who God is. And in that image of God, then there is a worth in every single one of us. But... This is very unusual. So in the time of the Bible, in the time that Christ was on the earth, there was a, a system of thinking that never considered humanity having worth because they're made in the image of God, but that you had to earn or that your life status had to uh, allow for worth in your life. And without that, 
then there's a very different cultural thinking and worldview that we have to begin to assume from this time. And as the gospel began to spread, what the implications were of what we began to see. And I'll start off in Hebrews chapter 10. Because Hebrews chapter 10, I'm going to start in verse um, I'm going to start in verse 23. And I just want to read what it says here. It says, Let's hold tightly without wavering to the hope of firm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So this is God's call to us to begin to affirm each other in the trust that we have in God. And so this idea of meeting together is not so that we can per se get to know God, though that's a great byproduct. That's a great thing that can happen when we get together in a setting like this, that you can learn things about God that maybe you didn't know otherwise. But that's not the central focus or central point. To, to feel God, to, to experience the presence of God. You know, another, it's like 70% of the population of believers seek out church for the sake of experiencing God and learning more about God. That's one of the main reasons why we meet together or attend together. But it's not the point. It's just a happy um, coincidence that that manifests itself when we do come together, hopefully. I mean, that, to me, is very, very important as well. Now, I know that that doesn't happen just because we meant like this. The Bible does say where two or more meet together, then God's right there in their presence. So it's not something that you have to go to a setting like this to achieve. Now, most everything that we present, most every way that we encourage in every part of the service, we're modeling things so that those things can begin to happen with you. Wherever you go, worship, we always love to begin with this uh, worship because the Word of God tells us that God inhabits the praises of His people. And so when we come together and begin to praise God and get our focus on Him and kind of off the circumstances and things happening in our life, then God inhabits that. God begins to come down and you begin to encounter that thing that sets apart from every other thing. And so that's hugely valuable, that's significant, but again, do you have to go to church to get those things? No, no, no. In fact, if we can get those things, we can read the Bible at home, we can, you know, there's so many ways that we can, you know, worship God and things, because worship isn't just an expression of singing. Worship is a way that we live our life. It's a way that we interact with people. It's a way that we trust God and seek Him in every circumstance. And so just by the way that we're living, in the circumstances that we are living, is an is a act of worship. It's an act of commitment. And so I'm going to go to a quick set. It's a list of four of things that biblically was at the very beginning of the established church or what we know to be meeting together at the beginnings of what this is supposed to do or what we're seeking out to achieve. And we can go to oops, uh, we can go to Acts chapter 2. Thank you so much. So Acts chapter 2 and as we started to allude to was the day of Pentecost. Pentecost means 50. It was 50 days after the resurrection. Then there was a celebration called the uh, Day of Pentecost. It was a great celebration. And in that celebration was the moment that God poured out his spirit on the world. Jesus identified and came and said, hey, you know, I'm leaving this place, but it's good for you that I go. Because if I go, then God will send the comforter to you. And so it's, it's, it's excellent and good. Though we're grieving Christ's Departing and moving to a different way to interact with us, by his leading, it opened the door for the Holy Spirit to come down. Because up to this point in history, God revealed himself through individuals, like a prophet, 
like a king or like um, or uh, great leaders like the judges. So God would reveal himself to just individuals to then disseminate um, the realization about God through that method. But with the coming of Christ and with this day of Pentecost, all of a sudden God released the Holy Spirit to all of mankind. So let's put us, ourselves in context. We're in the Middle East. We're over in the Mediterranean. And in this location, for all the centuries that we've ever had access to God, it has always come through that high leader or this or that person. We had to go to a prophet to find out things about God. But the prophets spoke of a time coming, a time in the future when no longer would a man have to seek out these things because God was going to write the truth on every man's heart. And we were going to know God from the least to the greatest. In a culture where there was a system or a class system that established that you had no worth except by your lineage, no worth except by what you do and what you do in the world. They said there's this time coming from the least to the greatest. God is going to reveal himself to all. And so the Holy Spirit gets poured out. And that presents a tragic problem in the Mediterranean. Because when we start looking back, when we go back to the establishment of the first church, when was it? It wasn't until like the third century that the Catholic Church organized in such a way that then we have the origins of what we identify as the church. Well, Christ was in the year 30. The 33 was the time of Christ. And 50 days beyond that, then they started living this out. And so this is, a, this is what the Catholic Church in the 3rd century tried to look back to. The reason why they didn't establish a church or a specified way of doing church was until the 3rd century was because now that the Holy Spirit is speaking to all of us, who do we believe? What do we focus on? What's the most important part of doing church? What's the most important part of meeting together? Because all these people who had all their life worshipped different um, gods that were in their culture. And they had different beliefs, different pagan belief systems. But God was the hound of heaven even then. And God was revealing himself to people through their cultural relevance and through the things that they were experiencing. But in that environment, now the Holy Spirit gets pulled up, poured out. And now they're behaving and acting in ways that still incorporate some of their pagan belief systems and some of those things. And so there was great disagreement always throughout the early time of establishing what should be godly and what shouldn't be godly. And so there was a lot of uh, uncertainty. If we go to the book of Acts, you can see that even God had always revealed himself through this people, Abraham's descendants, through the Hebrews and the Jews. And that was the representation to the world. But now all of a sudden, it's not just for the Jews. Now all of a sudden, it's open to Gentiles as well. Well, what the heck is a Gentile? <laughs> well, a Gentile. You have, if you're not a Jew, then you're in the other category of everybody else. Right? Gentile. Okay? So all of a sudden, now God has poured his spirit, which he always prophesied. He always talked about this being the original intent. And God taking us back towards that original intent. And now it's open to not only the Jews, but the Gentiles also. So I'm going to read this first story. And this is a, a story to the Jews. But then I'm going to read a second story. That this second story was the Gentiles. And it's the same kind of thing. So the first one came through Peter. The second one came through Paul. And each one became an apostle to that demographic. Okay? So we're in Acts chapter 2. We kind of set the stage. Got us a sense of where we're going. And here's what we see in verse 37. Peter got in front of everyone. It says, Peter's words pierced their heart. And they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you 
to your children and to those far away, all who've been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter confirmed or continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this wicked generation. Those who believed in what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 so 3,000 people in this setting, they were all Jews, and they were all seeking and waiting for the Messiah, and they said, hey, the Messiah has come, his name is Jesus, here's the things we can anticipate, and they were so compelling that this, that they came and they added to their numbers. So, is this discipleship making? No, this is convert making. They made converts that day, but God said to baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to Disciple, right? Disciple all nations. And so the discipleship process carries forward. Yes, there's an absolute place in church for convert making. That's very important. But the interesting thing is that the very first and frontline most important thing to God is, is that you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's the front, that's the first, the beginning of the process. But beyond that, beyond accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then what? Well, that's then, that point. God becomes interested in two things. Two things emerge as greater than all other things that God begins to desire for you. And that is the discipleship-making process. But it's to see your maturity increase. And to see your faith increase. So before we get into it any deeper, what does it take for your maturity to increase? Everything going your way? Everything being perfect all the time? No, I never grew when everything was amazing. I grow when I don't understand something and things aren't the way I thought they should be based on what I believe. And so I gotta change the way that I believe in this process so that then I begin to be mature in what God says about how the world works so I can change the way that we can begin to live in a way that's reflective of God. And then, our faith increasing. How important is that to God? Well, it's huge. Those two areas of life, your maturity increasing and faith increasing in your life, think about what God can do with you if your maturity increases. What can God do with you if your faith increases? More. That's what God can do. He can do more. He can do more and more and more in your life when those factors happen. But the circumstances surrounding those things are not easy. The circumstances surrounding maturity and surrounding your faith increasing don't always look good. So when we meet together with people, how many of you have been hurt by other people when you try to meet them? All of us, right? But let's not get it out of context. Let's make sure and ask all the questions, not just a couple of them. How many of you have been hurt in your marriage? Okay, so something about growth means it doesn't look the way that you think it should look, right? So it's going to be easy. How many of you have a perfect marriage? Everything is so smooth, there's not a ripple on the pond in your marriage. None of us. Because growth doesn't happen when the pond is set. It happens during the storms. Okay, so we come together to meet. We come together to experience God and to get more of God, to learn about God. That's why we meet together. The problem is everyone's sitting next to me. They're all the problem. They're the reason why I don't want to come to church. I was just out in the woods doing some hunting. I call it looking because I don't really kill anything, but I just like being in the woods. And so, any excuse is a good one to get out. So, I was out in the woods, and I was reminded again about wow, what an amazing Christian I am when I'm in the woods. <laughs> no one bothers me. <laughs> it's exactly the way I like it. You know, I'm just by myself in the woods. Maybe I'm going to be funny with me, and we're hanging out. Yeah. I could do Christianity like that. No one bothering me. The problem with that is no one ever then challenges what you think you believe. And your maturity is flatlined. 
You don't ever grow. I always just isolate myself away from other people because other people bother me. Other people don't do church the way I do church. They don't even want to do the same things I want to do. So we've got to reassess, like, wait a second, maybe that is the point, or maybe that's part of what God desires about us meeting together, is that somebody's going to rip you off. The hypocrisy that you can encounter in the church, it's, it, it's, un, it's, it's outside of compare. It's like you can find it everywhere. If you're looking for it, you will find it. It's very easy to find. Why? Because, not because of other people, but because of me. The church was doing just fine, but then I showed up. And my inconsistency, my brokenness, my not being consistent becomes part of the problem. Because I go in and I'm all messed up, and then I do things that are reflective of how messed up I am. And then it hurts me because, don't you know better? Don't you know that we don't do that here? Don't you realize that God has more for us than that? So all these things begin to emerge very quickly. So I better get moving or I'm going to run out of time. So, Acts 2, my good signal, he came up. So I'm going to run out of time. Okay, so Acts 2, I'm going to read these and I'll just kind of get them out because there is a, a real significant point that I'm going to draw out. It says in the community of believers, Acts 2, 42, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to pray. So those are the four things that church originally started as. These were the four things that people got. Those 3,000, those people that came, that was 3,000 plus. They said that people were adding to those numbers daily. Which means we're 3,000 plus. You know, we had the 120 in the upper room, then they go out and share this. Now, boom, you know, we move forward and 3,000 to that, and then each day more and more came. So they were getting more and more converts. They started getting, and this is what they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing in meals, and to prayer. And if we break those four things down, it says, devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. Okay, well, what were the apostles teaching on? What were they focusing on? The apostles were focusing on how Jesus lived differently than everyone else. In fact, I, I believe this, and I believe this is one of the hinges of perspective that's going to be really helpful. Think about eternity. Think about heaven. This eternal place, we often identify it as the Garden of Eden, the Promised Land. We as the church identify that as Summit. The name of our church means High Mountain Garden or Summit. And this high place where heaven and earth overlap. Those are that place. Is this place of identifying where we live as if we made it to heaven. As if accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior takes us to a place that it's supposed to be, takes us back to the promised land, takes us back to the Garden of Eden, to God's original intent. That's what God said. Like, hey, let's live as if everything is amazing. Even though people are still messed up, and even though people still hurt us, and even though there's all this brokenness that we live in the world, from you know every kind of thing, from medical issues to loss to every scenario, with marriages breaking down, all those things, we still live as if we made it. And what does that begin to look like? Well, we're devoting ourselves to what Jesus said about how the world works, right? The apostles' teaching is based on what Jesus said about how the world works. So that is what they begin to saturate themselves in, is this teaching. Okay? They, have, they all had ideas of belief. They all believed in Jesus. But they had to come together to file down the rough edges of their belief because they still had some pagan influences. They still had some <coughs> different ways that things managed. So they had to navigate through those things and work together. Can you guys do that at home by yourselves? Much more challenging. You can. But if we're looking at maturity arc, how successful is that arc? When we're not challenged ever because it's just the way I say it is and that's that. 
Yeah, we can. So definitely be in an environment that we're getting challenged regularly is, a, is an amazing potential for growth for us, amazing thing that God begins to release to us. So they were meeting together, focusing on the apostles' teaching. The second thing is to fellowship. What's fellowship? It's a weird thing to say. Fellowship is a tricky word. But what does that mean? Fellowship. I'm gonna I want to end on that point. So I'm gonna put that on the shelf for just one second. I'll come right back to that fellowship idea. But then goes on to say sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and groups, those two other things. So sharing in meals, it wasn't just like remembering what Jesus did, what his flesh was given for, and the new covenant that he was signing with us, that's part of the communion, that's this idea that we're coming together to remember. So, you know, sometimes you'll see that they have like wafers and they you know, remember the blood by the bread, you know, and then we remember by the wine um, or grape juice, depending on the you know, variation. We remember the covenant that was signed with the blood of Christ. They met together in houses and ate together. And so hanging out, spending time together and having dinner. What kinds of conversations happen over dinner? What kind of interactions happen over dinner? That's what we're, you know, that kitchen table interaction is the kind of stuff where we build relationships, we build family, we build connect with people is in that kind of thing. So that's what this is about. It's about connecting and building family together and remembering that because of what Jesus has done, now we have a new way to live. Now we can live in a whole new way. And then they talk about prayer, and then they to give themselves to prayer, which it's actually this idea that the Hebrew context of this idea of prayer was really worship, and this idea of what we talked about at the beginning of worship being this way we experience life, the way we live that honors and glorifies God. So based on everything that we're learning, everything we're taking in from the apostles' teaching, how is that then manifesting in our life out, outside of our home environment, outside of the particular environment that we created where we're hanging out together? Okay? And these begin to be the things. And so I just want to end on this idea of fellowship, because this is where something that just so brand new just jumped out to. And I think it's really the thing that I want to leave you guys with, is this idea of fellowship. Okay? And fellowship is, it actually is translated, the Hebrew word here is, it's called koinonia. Okay, and it's more than fellowship or hanging out and spending time together. It's about sharing. It's about sharing life together. It's about sharing themselves and who they are. And to a different degree than what we would expect. Let's read on in Acts chapter 2. It says in verse 43, it says a deep sense of awe. This is uh, Acts 2, 43. It says a deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything that they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. So in this environment, when we begin to live in a way that's consistent with bringing these ideas into our life in a culture that has a very different class system or a very different way of thinking about the value and the worth of people. And then it begins to manifest itself in this koinonia. Actually, koinonia is identified as grace. The grace of God. You're behaving inconsistent with the circumstances that have put you in a place to judge other people. To where then you start giving them what they don't deserve. Because Jesus handed us something that we didn't deserve. Based on my life, based on the way that I lived, I didn't deserve what Jesus did for me. But he gave it to me first as a gift. 
So there's a part of, um, of generosity, there's a part of grace that manifests as a gift. It's not something you can earn, it's not something that you can have because you worked for it. It's a gift. And when we and this was the Macedonian church. And just to get that little bit of background of what happened in the Macedonian church in Acts, in the middle of Acts, uh, there, there was a, a famine that hit Jerusalem. And that famine caused sickness, disease, brokenness, and starvation among the, the, those in Jerusalem. And in that place, all the believers were gathering around. And Paul was like, hey, wouldn't it be awesome if we got together and work together to raise some money to help support Jerusalem because of the famine that was there. But there was this other church that in that other church, the significant thing that was going on in that church, they were in Jerusalem, they were in Mesopotamia, and in that place, they were going to not ask them to be a part of the giving because that famine was so strong. And so this is in Acts chapter 4. And this is verse 32. It says, all believers were united in heart and mind. I mean, we're talking about thousands of believers. You know, even the day of Pentecost, everyone was in the same heart and mind. So unity was a factor to this generosity. It was a unity that came together. And in that midst of that unity, that everyone was coming together. It says, they felt what they owed was not their own. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and God, and God's great blessing was upon them all. Same word, point in the end. That great blessing, this grace was on them. This is Paul identifying something amazing has taken place with this group of people. When they're living for God and they're in great famine and loss, they've lost loved ones, they've lost you know, to the famine and the disease that was going on in that area at that time, their great loss, they should be absolutely falling apart. But this group of people had joy, and they had going in the air. So this great blessing was upon them all, and there were no needy people among them, because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. So there was something that was happening. This was something that was given by God. God gave this great blessing, this point of need, this grace for them to extend and operate in. And so what it began to produce was such a significant thing that when Luke was writing this work, the book of Acts, he was going around and, you know, interviewing everyone that had experienced God, and he wrote this down and felt like this was huge because of how people started to live, how people began to operate in a system where you show generosity, you show grace to those who deserved it. All of a sudden, this group of people is just going out of the water here, showing this kindness. This group of people, the Macedonian church, they were begging or pleading with the disciples to not exclude them from being able to give. Even though there were massive poor, huge poverty, and huge brokenness that was going on, they had a joy and they wanted to be about giving. The thing that I think is so significant in that is, is this idea of coming together in unity. And when we come together in unity as the body of believers, as the church, you, not this building or this place, then now we can come to a place where we're unified and we have great joy. And that great joy that we're operating in comes with generosity and it comes with this realization that we can, God is giving us something. And this grace that he's giving us is now the ability for us to live like he was because Christ was so gracious. The gift of God through salvation 
was such a gift to everyone. And what it can produce is it can take us to the original intent. It can take us back to God's original plan for humanity. And it can begin to release in us, us behaving like Christ. Us behaving like God. The thing that begins to be given and manifest in us when we get together and when we don't let all of the issues of people around us, when we don't let the frustration of other church folk stop us from meeting together, then we can get into this unity and this mindset where we can assume and act as if we've made it into heaven where every need is met. Everybody is taking care of everyone else. In fact, you know, I, I love to think about the, my first day in eternity, my first day in heaven. And in that day, every person that I encounter is going to do everything they can to resource me and make sure that I have everything that I can need so that I can be the fullest of who I was created to be. No resource will be withheld from me because the purpose in that place is not what we have, but what we can inspire with each other, what we can release, that we can inspire good things that we can do together. We can inspire each other to good works, and we can inspire each other to go make a difference in our community and make a difference in our world. And so I just want to challenge you as we get ready to leave that the purpose of church and to be a member of a church and to be included and involved in church is not so that you can experience God and know God. That's an amazing life product. But it's not the purpose. The purpose is to annoy you, to bother you out of the way you are thinking right now, to bother you out of the lies that you currently believe about what it means to be Christ like to be a Christian and to help inspire your maturity. It means things are not going to be easy. It doesn't mean that things are going to be the way you thought they were supposed to be because it's not going to be that way because the way that you thought it was supposed to be isn't producing what God desires in your life. It's not the thing that God wants for you and what he said about you. He wants so much more. He's desiring to rip the lid off of the potential of what can happen. And these stories were written because the authors were in awe of the generosity of the people. The, the authors were in awe of the way people were treating each other that didn't match the culture, didn't match society, didn't match what they stood for as a culture. And that is what I'm going to challenge you to start thinking. Go live in a way that assumes what Jesus did on the cross that assumes that's true. And if that's true, now we can live and we can love other people. We can live and be around people who don't deserve our compassion, don't deserve our everything that God offers us, but we can extend that because Jesus did for us. He said, if you want to fight against all of the, the rulers and the authorities in the world, if you want to overthrow the government, if you want to overthrow the sickness that's in the world, then I want to challenge you to start living as if what Christ did actually is true because that transformation will prove to the world the hope that we have in Jesus. The way that you live when we get together. Let's devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. Let's devote ourselves to fellowship or to this grace, this act of grace to everyone that we encounter. Let's Break bread. Remember what Jesus has done for us in the new covenant that we live in. And let's live a life of worship. That's about prayer. All prayer is is talking to God. And just interacting with God all the time. Jesus prayed without ceasing. Praying, talking to God all the time. That's the strategy. So don't leave this place the same. Let me challenge you. Attendance is so significant. Not for our sake, but for yours. You coming and being active in the pursuit is so vital for your growth and your maturity. So we're encouraging you to come every week. It's not because we want something from you. It's because we want something for you. We want this grace released in you 
that now, no matter what your circumstances are, you have joy that doesn't match your circumstances, a peace that passes all understanding. And he has grace that's given to you. Now you want to be a part of everything God's doing for his sake. We love you guys. Um, if you don't know Jesus today, if you haven't started this journey with Jesus, it's so easy. It's the simplest thing. It takes a lifetime to perfect, but it's literally just like the disciples. Everyone that was standing out in front of Peter when he was out with David Henry was, what should we do? It's like, well, you just accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Ask for forgiveness for all the things that you've been living, all the ways you've been living in accordance to what you define as the world, how the world works. And it's so messed up. God's like, just change the way you think about that. Let's do it slightly different. And in that way, we begin the process of changing the way we think so that it lines up with what God says. And the more you come, the more you get around people who are trying to do the same thing and they suck at it. They do, I do, we all do. Okay, but that will help us shape. That will plow off the rough edges. You know, make us be more Christ-like. If you've done that today, if you want to do that, we have leaders that will come up and you know, be able to help and coach you through that. It's so easy. And then we'll do it together. We'll walk this life out, not just about converts, but about making disciples, which is like family, which is messy. It's a mess. It's a mess. And we're a mess in that way. For Jesus' sake. Love you guys. In Jesus' name.